I was inspired two weeks ago when Reverend Donna Giver Johnson visited us and preached about how we, the church, are to be the resurrection people. And whether you were here or not, she gave this lovely illustration of her first church when she was a young pastor and a small child asking her, when, when on Easter Sunday we say to each other, Christ has risen and the church responds, he has risen indeed, and this young child said, well, where is Jesus if he's risen indeed? And she gave this beautiful response, not in that day, but some years in reflection later, how to answer, if Jesus is risen, where is he? Well, he's here in each of you. We are Jesus with skin on, Donna said. So as I looked at the lectionary text for this seventh Sunday in Easter, I saw that our gospel reading is from John 17, uh, one of the few places where we have words that we believe Jesus prayed for his disciples and on our behalf. And it struck me that if we are indeed to be the resurrection people, Jesus with skin on, then it's probably important that we pay attention to the words that Jesus prayed for us. As Jesus is preparing to finish his ministry, to perhaps be aware of his in, impending death, his resurrection, and as we celebrated in some traditions this week, his ascension, he prays for us. He pauses in the midst of his own life and offers a prayer for us. It seems to me that what he prays for us at that moment might be key in us becoming who God desires us to be as Jesus' representatives in this world. So as we hear these words from John 17, see what you notice. Jesus prays for us. Let us listen to God's word this morning. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, I have made your name known to those who you gave to me in this world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking, I am praying on their behalf. I am asking I, I, am a, I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name, that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost ex except the one destined to be lost, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I'm coming to you, and I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, so that they also may be sanctified in truth. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one. I in them, and you in me that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. We'll cut right to the chase. It's been a full and rich morning already, and yes, I'm trying to fit a sermon in here. 
Jesus prays for four things that I see in this passage. And the first thing is that Jesus prays for our sending. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world. Rather, as you sent me into the world, I send them. You, friends, are all sent ones. This is where we get our word apostle. Have you ever thought of yourself as an apostle, a sent one into the world? There is perhaps nothing more that defines a Christian or a Jesus follower than to know that you are sent by God. God the Father sends God the Son, the Son who was in the world, and Jesus then moves into the neighborhood. The Word becomes flesh and dwells among us. Jesus is the embodiment of God with us. God makes God's home from heaven to earth. So it is with us. Jesus said, as God sent me, so I send you. As we will celebrate next week at Pentecost, the Son, Jesus, then sends the Spirit of truth who comes alongside us, fills us, is with us forever, enabling us to be like Jesus and move into neighborhoods, be with people, go and walk and talk and laugh and love and serve in the flesh of this world. Just like Jesus, we are sent ones to particular places and spaces in our lives. This is the very nature and character of the Trinity a missio dei, if you will, ascending God on mission. That is why Jesus prays that God would not take us out of the world. Jesus prays that we would be in the world and not abandon our essence, our mission, that embodies the very nature of who God is. And I wonder if perhaps part of Jesus' prayer is that he knew that our tendency would be to withdraw to find sanctuary. We build buildings and we call them sanctuaries where we find safety. And our tendency as human beings is to be around those who we feel comfortable with and safe with. There's nothing wrong with that. And yet Jesus says, don't take them out of the world. Send them back into the world. Let us not lock our doors proverbially like the disciples did in those early days of Jesus' resurrection out of fear of what's out there, preferring safety and security and insulating and isolating ourselves. Let me ask you, think about your everyday ordinary week. Where do you spend time? In your home, on your street, in your workplace? your office building, with family, with friends? What do you do on Fridays and Saturday nights to have fun and relax? Could this not be the very places and spaces where God is sending you to be Jesus with skin on? Jesus asks God in his prayer to not let his disciples, those who would follow him, to be taken out of the places and actually sends them into neighborhoods, onto streets, into office buildings, among family members, working in organizations in this world for the building and establishment of God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. He doesn't pray that we are taken out of the world. Rather, his second prayer is that God would protect us. God, protect them by the power of your name. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. How does it strike you this morning to think that Jesus prayed for your protection? Do you feel like in life, as you walk through this world and go through your everyday ordinary life, that you are a person that needs protection? I find it an intriguing thing to ponder as we, many of us live in great security in a first world country. If we are in fact sent ones, like Jesus says, and we live in the world, it is likely that we will meet resistance and temptation to stray, to go a different way, to live a different way either within ourselves or from outside ourselves. There are, in fact, forces at work in us and in this world that resist the movement of God in the world. 
When we are about love and mercy and kindness and freedom and inclusion and justice, we might need to be protected as we seek to live that out and embody it in the world. There are ways of living that Jesus modeled and taught that are very difficult to do and run counter to cultural norms and our own personal preferences. Jesus faced much resistance. The church throughout history, when living faithfully, faced much, much resistance as well. And it should be no surprise to us then that we might face resistance in the world as we allow light to shine in darkness, love to shine upon hate, kindness to shine upon cruelty, peace shining upon violence and war, or humility shining upon our own prideful and egotistical ways. We will need to be protected from a multitude of temptations and delivered from evil. We will pray that prayer in just a few moments. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Jesus prayed, I think, on this Mother's Day of his prayer. He wished that he could gather the people of God under his mothering wings and protect them, shelter them, keep them. If Jesus prayed for our protection, and it is his desire to be like a mother hen and shelter us and gather us, I wonder why in myself I resist this idea of needing to be protected. I don't know how that lands with you, but I wonder in myself if perhaps I don't think I need to be protected, maybe, just maybe, I'm not taking enough risks. I'm choosing to live too safely. Thirdly, Jesus prays for our holiness. He says, they are not of this world even as I am not of this world. Sanctify them by the truth for your word is truth. Now I don't know what you think of when you hear this word sanctification and holiness, but I have a whole spiritual background of holiness kinds of churches that lives in me. I see you looking at me. He's making eye contact. That stirs some things up in me. But we are to be a people that are to be made holy. To be aware that, Christ, that in Christ we are not of this world. We are citizens of another kingdom. We march to the beat of a different drum. Our values and our eth ethics are different from this world in which we live. We are set apart by Christ who speaks his word to us and it cleanses us and sanctifies us and changes us so that we can participate in the mission in the world. And this is not a holiness that's a holier-than-thou kind of attitude, but it's a holiness integrated into the natural human lives, human uh, interactions of our lives. It requires what one has called a whimsical holiness, a holiness that comes through Christ but is simultaneously engaging all people um, who we love and live among. I've borrowed this phrase from a book called The Tangible Kingdom where they explain this. Whimsy is the posture that allows people to be themselves. It paves the way for them to feel comfortable enough to be themselves, feel loved and dignified as human beings. Holiness is that quiet inner posture that shines through and subversively witnesses to an alternative way to live. Whimsy implies that you can seamlessly interact in a culture and with a variety of humans with ease, humor, and love, and holiness. I believe we see this all throughout the ministry of Jesus, a whimsical holiness. He was regularly in the presence of all kinds of different people, sex workers, wealthy and corrupt business people, the terminally ill, the socially outcast. He hung out at both wedding receptions in the temple and he fished with the working class. He associated with religious leaders who wanted to maintain the establishment and he associated with zealots who wanted to burn the whole thing down. All the while maintaining his own sense of self, 
a whimsical holiness. What about you? How do you feel when you hang out with people who are different from you? Whatever stripe or color or reason that you recognize they're different from you. How does it feel to have Jesus pray for you to become holy, whimsically holy in those situations where you find yourselves, in your neighborhood, walking the streets, or in the workplace? The final thing that Jesus prays for is he prays for our unity and oneness. And listen to these words again. I pray that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Jesus and God the Father. You don't have to be a theologian to understand that they were pretty one. They were unified, connected, like a reflection in a mirror like two partners after 50 years of marriage, like an envelope licked and sealed. The two were in fact one, Jesus and God. And Jesus prays that all of us who say that we are the resurrection people, the church, the body of Christ, he prays that we would experience that kind of oneness. Wow. Because when that happens, Jesus says, the world that we're sent into will know that God loves them. Unity and oneness with one another as followers of Jesus may seem completely unachievable these days. In our hyper-individualism, in theological divisiveness in the church. And yet, the unity of the church and the local church congregation is a reality. We are one with one another. The baptism that we just welcomed these beautiful children into, we are also baptized of the same water. On Sundays when we take communion, we eat of the same bread and drink of the same cup, and it connects us to God in God's unity and to one another in the unity of the body of Christ. The question for us is, how are we building and establishing the truth of what's really real? Well, let me close with some simple, practical suggestions. Oneness, I think, begins and is worked on by simply this, getting over ourselves. I can tell you this morning, I am not the center of the universe. And I know Cynthia, who's laughing in this fifth pew here, she knows that she is not the center of the universe. When we can begin practicing getting over ourselves, our oneness and connectedness with one another will be more manifest and more real and more alive in the church of Jesus Christ. Amen? And we can do this in such simple ways. When you offend someone, say you're sorry. When you realize that you're wrong, say you're sorry. Give up your right to be right and choose to forgive someone else even when they're in the wrong. Seek out people who are really different from you economically, ethnically, theologically, personally different from you and practice just listening to them. Communicate what you think and feel to be the truth that is within you. Don't apologize for it but be attentive to it. Be willing to accept the fact that even in this place, even in this sanctuary this morning, there is a diversity and plurality of understanding of what it means to be a human and Christian in this world. And that is a gift. 
not something to be fixed. Practice gratitude. And finally, choose some creative, whimsical ways to serve and love somebody that annoys you. Find ways to go out of your way, to be kind to someone who drives you crazy. For if we are begin to practice whimsically, embodying the oneness that actually exists in the body of Christ, the world, the people that you work with, that live on your street, might say, what's happening in that place called East Liberty Presbyterian Church? Y'all are really diverse, and you seem to like each other, and you kind of get along with each other. This is Jesus' point. The world will know that God is love, and God sent Jesus into the world to embody love. Lord, in your mercy, may we hear this morning your prayer for us. Amen.